On July 17, 1918, the 300 year long reign of the Russian Romanov dynasty came to a shocking end. In a basement in Yekaterinburg, a city in Siberia, Bolshevik captures moved Tsar Nicholas II, together with his wife Tsarina Alexandra, their five children, and four attendants to the basement of a house they had been imprisoned at for over a month. Although official accounts of what exactly happened are to this day unclear, word quickly spread around Russia that the brutal events that transpired in that basement meant the Tsar and his family were no more. Yet because of the ongoing civil war and general chaotic situation in former Russian Empire, much was unclear about the fate of the royal family. Although it quickly became known they were murdered, a genuine mystery and near legend developed around the whereabouts of the remains, which weren't found throughout the entire existence of the Soviet Union, which lasted for most of the 20th century. But even more fascinating, a legend developed around Anastasia, the youngest 17-year-old daughter of the royal couple. Because rumors spread around Europe that she might have actually survived the execution, and in the years following the communist takeover, several pretenders stepped forward to claim they were Anastasia. Obviously, many were frauds, but some were so believable that actual Romanovs, family members of the royal couple, believed it. The legend around the fate of Grand Duchess Anastasia of Russia is one that captured the imagination of Russians and other Europeans alike during the 20th century, and was conclusively solved only 12 years ago, in 2008. The Romanov dynasty ruled over the Russian Empire for 300 years, yet in early 1917 that came to an abrupt end. Kerensky's February Revolution led to the overthrow of the monarchy and the installation of a provisional government. Imperial forces that crushed every revolt until then threw away their guns or shot at their own officers and joined the revolution themselves. On March 2nd, Tsar Nicholas II signed his abdication. The Tsar, together with his wife Alexandra Fyodorovna and their daughters Olga, Tatyana, Maria, Anastasia and their son, the Tsarevich Alexei, were put under house arrest at their summer residence, the Tsarskoy Selo Palace. They were subsequently moved to the small city of Tobolsk in Siberia, locked up away from the most significant developments of this revolution. Yet, this wasn't the final revolution, because in October that year, the Bolsheviks under Lenin seized power. A radical communist regime was implemented with institutions such as the much feared secret police, the Cheka, smothering any opposition that might stand up. Leon Trotsky set up the Red Army, an efficient and unscrupulously lethal army fighting the anti-Bolshevik white forces. The civil war waged over the country for several years, leading to millions of casualties. But the Tsar and his family wouldn't be around to experience this. Their guards decided they had to move them away from Tobolsk because the Royalist White Army led by Admiral Alexander Kolchak was on its way to take over the city. 13-year-old Tsarevich Alexei, suffering from ill health for most of his life, got sick, which meant he couldn't be transported. He stayed behind together with Anastasia, Olga and Tatyana, while some soldiers moved Tsar Nicholas, Tsarina Alexandra and their third daughter, 19-year-old Maria, together with several servants. The Tsar, Tsarina and Maria were put on carriages and rode through the ice-cold Siberian landscape until they reached Tumen, the largest city in the area. Here, they boarded the train and traveled to Moscow via Yekaterinburg. At least that was a plan, but in Yekaterinburg, their guards decided to hand them over to the local authorities, the Bolsheviks. They were locked up in the house of a local merchant, the so-called Ipatyev house. In May, Alexei's health improved, and he too, together with Olga, Tatyana and Anastasia, was sent to Yekaterinburg. There, they were locked up with their parents. The family stayed in the Ipetyev house for over a month, guarded by Bolsheviks led by Yakov Yurovsky. On July 17, 1918, the Bolsheviks decided the Tsar and his family were a potential threat to their revolution. An unsigned telegram sent to Yurovsky from Moscow told them that due to the military situation and advancing white army, the execution should happen without delay. The circumstances of what exactly happened are a bit unclear even nowadays, but what is for sure is that the Bolshevik guards took the Romanov family to the basement of the Ipatyev house and shot all of them. The photograph you're seeing right now is of the actual place of execution in the Ipatyev house's basement. 
Some of their children didn't die instantly, upon which the Bolsheviks killed them with bayonets. There are very detailed accounts of what happened to the bodies afterwards, which I won't tread into detail about. It was an incredibly grisly and inhumane business. Following the executions, the Bolsheviks loaded the bodies onto trucks for their disposal. They initially wanted to leave them in a mineshaft, but figured the White Army would quickly discover the remains if they started looking for them. While the Bolsheviks were figuring out what to do with the bodies at the mineshaft, some Bolsheviks realized the girls had sewn gems in their nightgowns, jewels such as diamonds, rubies and emeralds. It was a much practiced method actually by the Russian nobility that tried to flee the country during the revolution. This way they could pawn the gems and jewels if they made it across the border. The hypothesis goes that the gem-filled corsets acted as bulletproof vests to the girls. And according to later statements by the men that were present at the execution, the gems indeed did act as bulletproof vests. But it only prolonged the unfortunate death of the girls because that's why the Bolsheviks guards ended up using their bayonets to finish the job. At any rate, the Bolsheviks had to hurry because the White Army was approaching Yekaterinburg. The city would fall to Admiral Kolchak's army a week later, on July 25th. The Bolsheviks disfigured and burned the bodies, buried them in shallow graves and covered the graves with railroad ties. From then on out, over 80 years, the bodies would remain undiscovered in their shallow graves. That's the way the story officially goes. But throughout the decades, rumors were rife about members of the family surviving the execution, in particular the youngest daughter of the Tsar. Over seven decades of speculations, doppelgangers and confessions fueled rumors about Anastasia's survival. Around the entire world, separate from each other, people that claimed to either be Anastasia or Maria turned up during the following decades. They claimed they survived the execution and fled the country. Because no bodies were found, some of these claims were rather credible and actually received much support from former Imperial Russian officers and nobility. The cult surrounding the Romanov pretenders, especially the believers in some of the women that claimed to be Anastasia, was mockingly called the Anastasians. The most famous case must be that of Anna Anderson. Throughout her entire life, she claimed she was the youngest daughter of the Tsar. Her story started in Berlin in February 1920, two years after the executions. A woman jumped off a bridge into the Landwehr Canal in an attempt to take her own life. It failed. She was taken to the hospital where police found no identification on her, no labels in her clothes and odd scars on her body. She refused to tell them who she was. She spoke German with a strong Slavic accent, and while asleep she often switched to speaking Russian or English. Admitted to the psychiatric Daldorf Asylum, she became known as Fraulein, unbekannt, Mrs. Unknown in German. Over the years, she remained silent, engaging in barely any social interaction with her handlers. Now, in 1922, another patient was released from Daldorf and publicly claimed she saw Grand Duchess Tatiana, the second oldest daughter of the Tsar there. Rumor quickly spread. Perhaps one of the Tsar's daughters actually had survived the execution. Word reached the Russian nobility émigrés in Paris that Grand Duchess Tatiana might still be alive, locked up in the German asylum. The High Monarchist Union, an organization uniting the Russian nobility in exile, set up an investigation in the matter. They sent several representatives to Daldorf. However, our Fraulein, unbekannt, was rather hesitant to cooperate at first. They showed her photographs of family members, servants, and people she must have known if she was in fact Tatiana. During some of the conversations with her, it was noted her knowledge about European royal houses was rather extensive for a girl her age, to say the least. Yet she never confirmed she was Tatiana, not entertaining the Russian monarchists, eager to find out her true identity. There was much criticism about the claim, after all, the girl was too short to be Tatiana, according to those that had known Tatiana. But when confronted with this, the girl is said to simply have replied, I never said I was Tatiana. One of the former personal guards to the Empress Dowager, mother of Nicholas II, decided that if the girl couldn't say who she was, then perhaps she could confirm it by writing. He gave her a list with four names of the Tsar's daughters. The girl crossed out three names, a 
except for the name Anastasia. Although the way she looked sickly and tried and tested by life did not in any way compare to a Grand Duchess, she sparked the interest of both German and Russian nobility, and the Romanovs themselves. Following her release from the asylum, the Russian émigré family von Kleist took her in, where she revealed her supposedly real name and story. She reminisced how she survived the executions thanks to the sewn in gems in her garments. A Bolshevik soldier noticed she was still breathing after the executions, took pity on her, and smuggled her to safety at dawn. She then pawned the gems to subsidize our border crossing through Ukraine and Romania, only to end up in Germany. During these interwar years, an enormous amount of people from private detectives to former monarchist officers to Russian nobility in exile to Soviet intelligence officers tried to find out the truth. Could Anastasia really have survived? There are anecdotes of the girl that took on the name of Anna that she occasionally referred to herself as Anastasia or would burst into tears upon hearing a waltz that was known to be played to the Romanov children. Yet Anna was known to throw fits of rage when extended family members were introduced to her under false pretenses, usually to see if she was an imposter. In her defense, she'd say she was humiliated after all. These people didn't come to see her as their family, and because nobody had seen the girl for years, no one could conclusively say if it was Anastasia or if it wasn't. In 1928, the Empress Dowager Maria Fyodorovna, mother of Nicholas II, passed away. From then on, the Romanovs explicitly distanced themselves from Anna. The only Romanov that was still convinced Anna was Anastasia was her uncle, Grand Duke Andrei Vladimirovich. He started his own investigation, but the results were never available to the public. After his death, his family kept his archives locked away. But meanwhile, many others too believed Anna's claims. In order to properly collect evidence, an organization was set up, Gandanur. This is an acronym for Grand Duchess Anastasia of Russia. Gleb Botkin, Anna's most loyal supporter, stood at the forefront. His father was murdered together with the Tsarist family as part of their entourage, and Gleb said he recognized Anna from his childhood. Among other things, Grandanur protected the rise to Anna's life story from Hollywood, where filmmakers had caught on about her curious claims already. But more importantly, from 1938, Grandanor and Anna filed a plethora of court cases in order to keep the Romanovs away from Anna's legitimate inheritance. Decades of lengthy legal proceedings followed. It became the longest-running legal battle in German history. An excessive amount of scientific and medical reports trying to either confirm or refute Anna's claim were written for the court case. Surprisingly, these reports supported Anna's claims in unexpected areas. For example, the graphologist that examined Anna Frank's diary concluded that Anna's handwriting was identical to that of Anastasia. Her feet had the same bunions and she had a scar where Anastasia had a mole removed. The anthropologist Dr. Otto Reche examined her face and concluded that it was similar to that of Anastasia to an uncanny degree. If she wasn't Anastasia, then she could only be her identical twin. Psychological reports stated that Anna knew so many intricate details of Anastasia's life that it was very likely she experienced it all herself. Yet, the parties countering Anna's claim made use of a 1927 investigation that stated Anna was Franziska Szanskowska, a Polish factory worker that disappeared after being injured by a factory explosion. Although the Szanskowska family refused to identify Anna as Franziska multiple times, this narrative was deemed at least somewhat believable because the timelines matched up, and Franziska's brother claimed that he thought she was Anna, albeit off the record. It wasn't until February 1970 that the German High Court came to a definitive verdict. The High Court determined that not enough tangible evidence was provided to establish Anna's real identity. Yet, they conceded that there was an absence of concrete evidence to confirm the death of Grand Duchess Anastasia in Yekaterinburg, which meant the courts didn't entirely deny Anna's claim that she was Anastasia. Meanwhile, Anna herself settled in the United States and got married there. She passed away in 1984 from pneumonia. She was buried in the churchyard of the Sion Abbey, a Benedictine monastery, which had strong ties to the von Leuchtenbergs, German nobility closely related to the Romanovs. There were at least four other women that claimed to be Anastasia, seven men that claimed to be Tsarevich Alexei, 
and many others had claimed they were one of the three other daughters. In 1920, Nadezhda Vasilyeva was arrested by Bolshevik authorities while trying to cross the border with China. Bolshevik border guards detained her, and when she claimed she was Anastasia, she was locked up in an asylum. She died there in 1971. The triple agent Michael Golunevsky that defected to the United States in 1961 claimed he was a Tsarevich, although his claims weren't considered that credible, to be fair. In short, Anna certainly wasn't the only one claiming to be Anastasia, but her case was the most widely known, both because of her eccentricity and the number of people that believed she actually was Anastasia, and the books, films, and tabloids published about her story. Although Anna's case is definitely the most famous one, following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, interest in the fate of the Romanovs recommenced. Due to the declassification of many secret reports following the fall of the Soviet Union, a secret report by Yurovsky came to the attention of geologists. Thanks to this report, the location of nine bodies was discovered in Siberia, in the vicinity of the place the Romanovs stayed during their last days. These bodies could very well be the Romanovs. So, you'd expect that through DNA testing, the mystery of the Romanov survivors would finally be put to rest once and for all. But, well, quite the contrary happened. DNA testing confirmed that the remains found were of Tsar Nicholas II, his wife Tsarina Alexandra, three of their daughters, and four servants. The remains of little Tsarevich Alexei, and either the remains of 19-year-old Maria, or that of Anastasia, were missing. The fact the investigators didn't find these remains fueled speculations about their fate even more. Following the realization two remains were missing, another famous revelation came to light. That was the story of the South African Granny Alina. She passed away in 1969, but following the discovery of the Romanov grave and the missing bodies, her foster grandson Gabriel Louis Duval published the book, A Princess in the Family. It was the result of his research following the revelation and his belief that Alina was Grand Duchess Anastasia. During her life, Alina told her family that she was a Russian duchess that fled during the revolution, but her entire family was killed. Duval's claims didn't go unnoticed. The Australian Monash University and the universities of Sheffield and Manchester decided to examine Granny Alina's remains in cooperation with Duval. No usable DNA was found, so instead the Sheffield and Manchester universities created composition sketches and facial reconstructions of Alina and compared that to Anastasia. Both teams of scientists, independent of each other, concluded that Alina could not be Anastasia. But surprisingly enough, both teams claimed that they thought Alina could very well be the third daughter, Maria. The only noticeable difference between the two was the jawline, but this could be accredited to a jaw fracture following the botched execution. Because the dominant discourse in the West was that Anastasia was missing, Duval never really considered Alina to be Maria. These findings sparked the theories that Alina was Grand Duchess Maria and that she managed to escape to South Africa and start a new life there. Because of the lack of DNA evidence, the only way this theory could be refuted was if the remaining bodies were found, however. And any conclusive evidence of the whereabouts of the other two bodies would not be found for another decade. In 1998, the Russian government and remaining Romanovs reburied the five remains of Nicholas, Alexandra and the three daughters in the crypt of the Romanov family in St. Peter and Paul Cathedral in St. Petersburg, 80 years after their executions. On August 14, 2000, several members of the Romanov family were canonized and declared passion bearer by the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia had already done this 22 years earlier, in 1978, and already in 1977 authorities ordered the demolition of the Ipatyev House, on the spot where the Ipatyev House was built the Church of Blood in honor of all saints resplendent in the Russian land. After the burials in 2000, it went quiet again, surrounding the two missing bodies. That was until August 2007, nearly 90 years after the executions occurred. Euronews published about the discovery of two remains that were probably that of Maria and Tsarevich Alexei. In late April 2008, Russian scientists in an American laboratory confirmed this through DNA analysis. This discovery definitively proved that none of the Romanovs managed to escape the execution that fateful day in July 1918, and as beautiful and intriguing as the stories of those that claimed to be the surviving Romanovs were, this conclusively proved they were all made up. All of the pretenders had long been dead by this point, 
and I am sure that many of them actually believe their story to the last minute. Now, previously I mentioned Empress Dowager Maria Fyodorovna, mother of Tsar Nicholas II, and I created a video about her family, because her father, King Christian IX of Denmark, was an incredibly fascinating person. He was known as the father-in-law of Europe, and for good reason. The video will be on screen shortly if you're interested in that. Thank you very much for watching this video. I would also really like to thank all my patrons for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.